Joining me live now, Corey Stroller, Michael Dunn's defense attorneys here in the studio with me. Let's start here with the appeal. You said that you, you plan to appeal this decision. On what grounds do you plan to base your appeal? Well, there are some pretrial rulings made by the first judge, uh, Miss Judge Suzanne Bass. We had recused. She was one of the ones that denied bond. She denied indigency costs for my client, which obviously would have helped in his defense in terms of funding for experts, uh, psychiatrists to talk about what happened moments after that shot in terms of acute stress disorder, post-traumatic syndrome. We're also going to be appealing rulings that happened throughout the trial, including the very last instruction that was read by Judge Healy prior to those verdicts coming down. And, and we should note here that the specific complaint regarding the instruction Basically, the way the law works is if you're justified using deadly force in Florida against one person, you cannot be charged for others of what was called collateral or words we've heard of that. Basically, the fact that the jury deadlocked and even asked the question, if we hold him justified in self-defense on one, is that for everybody? And the judge answer was no, everybody must be considered separate. Much has been made of... of some of the jailhouse letters that your client wrote while awaiting trial. <clears throat> How surprised are you that the prosecution did not uh, try to introduce those letters to at least attempt to rebut your portrayal of Mr. Dunn as, as gentle and, and calm? Well, I think a lot of those letters weren't relevant. We do have rules of evidence, and I can tell you on both sides, there was evidence that I could not bring in that Judge Healy denied because of rules of evidence regarding Jordan Davis and the other gentleman in the car. Same thing with the Michael Dunn letters and some of the audio tapes. So we do have rules of evidence that come into play. The judge did make some pretrial rulings, so I think that may have prohibited a lot of it. But a lot of those letters are letters to his family. They're, they're letters to his grandparents, his daughter, his mom and dad. In one of those letters, Dunn wrote to an undisclosed recipient, quote, I just got off the phone with you, and we were talking about how racist the blacks are up here. The more time I am exposed to these people, the more prejudiced against them I become. I suppose the white folks who live here are pretty much anti-black, at least the ones who have been exposed to them. You've said in the past that Michael Dunn is not a racist, and, and the same as he said the same thing. When you read <clears throat> this letter, not just the excerpt, I mean, we could, we could show other letters. Right. It reads like a racist letter. And you have to understand, and I would agree with you, if you take that snippet out of it, this is a man that was never exposed to a jail cell or a jail system, was put in isolation, and unfortunately, it was a culture shock. When so you the have, jail made him racist? I wouldn't say the jail made him racist, but the jail made him think differently about the race. In jail, there are racism. The whites have issues with blacks. The blacks have issues with whites. Hispanics have issues with that. So inside the jail, there's a dynamic. And when you're threatened, threatened daily about, we're going to rape you when we get your hands on you, we're going to kill you when we get your hands on you, and it's coming from the black inmates walking by his cell banging on the door, it, after about 12 to 15 months of this, it may change the way you look at it. And there's actually a phone call that he does talk to his family and says, I'm starting to think differently. I never thought like this. I never believed this. In fact, Michael Dunn has an African-American uh, nephew who's part of their family and who has been to Thanksgiving, who's been to dinners. It, it, two of his former wives are Hispanic. If Jordan Davis had a gun, why didn't he fire that gun when, when, uh, when Michael Dunn started shooting? I don't believe he either had the time or had the, the knowledge and ability to do so. And in that aspect, I think once a 17-year-old kid with a gun, even if he thought, I'm just going to scare this guy, I'm going to get that gun out and show him I'm a boss, I'm a big man, mind your own business. When Michael Dunn then turns around and he sees that he racks one in the chamber, even at that point, the kids in the car all ducked, and the only one who said didn't duck was Jordan Davis. Why was there no residue on, on Jordan Davis's hand? I mean, even if he had a gun in his hand, there would have been a trace of residue. That, that's absolutely false. You will not get an expert in the world to say that. It's if the gun was fired and the residue is so sensitive that literally wiping your hands off or washing your hands and not one single kid, including Jordan Davis, nobody's hands were tested by forensic. The forensics by law enforcement was literally non-existent in this case. Why, why did Dunn's fiance uh, say that Dunn didn't tell her that he had a gun? It, her recollection, if you look at the evidence, about a day later, the state took a sworn statement from Ms. Rower. That's the fiance. She indicated that he didn't mention a gun. 
when I talked to her and I said, based on your mental state, and if you saw the testimony of her on the stand. Sure. Which I did. She was hysterical. She couldn't walk off the stand. And she even said, hold on, let me finish. Her mental state was worse on the night of the shooting and the next day. That strains credulity. You know that. I, I, I don't agree with you, and hear me out. If someone's mental state is so much worse than being able to stand and walk and compose themselves, I even asked her, is it a possibility he mentioned there was a gun and you don't recall it? I can tell you, there are about three or four witnesses that we're going to be calling in the retrial where she did talk about that afterwards. The problem is she gave a sworn statement to law enforcement, mm -hmm. and they held her to that statement and not to waver, what? and I got her to waver on cross-examination. Why weren't you able to produce a, a single witness to say that George Davis ever had a gun? We did. It was Michael Dunn. The only B besides two Michael Dunn. Well, here we go. The only two people that know what happened that we're looking. Every single state's witness outside of the kids in the car indicate they were not looking over in that area until after they heard the gunshot being fired. Matter of fact, the one witness who claims he heard Mr. Dunn say something, he even said, I only looked at the gun. I never looked at the SUV. So not one single witness could talk about Jordan Davis being out of the car. And even the kids in the car admitted he could have threatened Michael Dunn, but they didn't hear him. The prosecution has, has said that it's going to retry on this, this top count. Are you going to represent Michael Dunn in the retrial? As it stands right now, yes. There are a lot of things that come into play. We talked about the defense budget. We talked about the fact that we knew... What we would having experts. more money, what, would, what difference would that have made for the defense? We would be able to bring in psychological and psychiatrist experts to show that when you are in a life-and-death fight-or-flight situation, what the mind goes through, what somebody may go through. And, and we get it. From day one, we understood it was going to sound irrational that he left the scene, that he didn't call 911. But in, let me finish. But until someone puts a gun in your face and you believe your life is in, in jeopardy at that moment, you never know how you're going to react. The but, it, but, it's, but at some point after that, even if you fear that your life is in danger, you pick up the phone and you call authorities, do you not? He did the very next day. The next day? Absolutely. Why not an hour later? Why not two hours later? That's why a psychiatrist and a forensic expert would come into play to talk about how the human mind works. We have acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And there you, are you didn't have the funding to do that this time. We did not have the witnesses. As a matter of fact, the one witness we did have, Judge Healy excluded him from the trial, and that will be part of an appeal as well. Do you know the jury breakdown on the hung charge by any chance? The, and the jury breaks down on the hung charge. We do not, and, and they don't, unfortunately, I'd love to know, but yeah. the way it works, they do not give you whether it was first, second, and I can tell you this, if you look at one of the last questions they asked, their question to the judge was, if we find self-defense on one, is it self-defense for all? So my humble opinion is that jury was hung on Jordan Davis was getting out of the car and that Michael Dunn shot in self-defense. And the minute Judge Healy instructed them that every count has to be broken down separately, that's when they were hung on count one and came back guilty on the lessers on counts two, three, and four. Dunn apparently also wrote a letter to you while he was in jail. Um, this one, he's, and this one he, he talked about you in a letter that he wrote to his daughter. Okay. He said in part, it's almost as if they're trying to hold me for as long as possible because they know they have such a weak case against me and no chance of winning. Coy, my attorney, says, I have a much stronger case of self-defense than Zimmerman does, writing of George Zimmerman. He said that I should not worry if he loses, but it's a great sign if he wins. Zimmerman was acquitted. Your client was not. Why, why was your calculation off? And I don't think my calculation is off. I think Mr. Dunn took what I said out of context. What I was explaining to him is, in Zimmerman, they were trying to show that George Zimmerman was the aggressor, that he got out of the car, he approached Trayvon Martin, he created that conflict, that physical confrontation. In Mr. Dunn's case, and I think what I was trying to convey to him, is that he didn't start a confrontation. Everybody keeps calling this a loud argument over music. Every guy in that car admitted on cross-examination that Mr. Dunn didn't raise his voice. He didn't curse. He didn't, he didn't have throw... to raise his voice. He took out a, a gun and, and fired 10 shots, that 10 was, rounds. That was after and, Jordan Davis got out of and the car why, with a weapon. And, Corey, let me ask you this before I let you go. Sure. Why, why 10 shots? I mean, if... if if, if he was concerned, if, if the goal was to try and, and keep this dangerous teenager at bay and to save his life, 
Why not a warning shot? One in the air. <laughs> why not two shots? Why not even maybe even three shots? And I don't mean a laugh, but by saying why not a warning shot, there is a, a black African-American female in jail right now in Duval County where my client was prosecuted. Her defense was she fired a warning shot and Miss Corey and Mr. Guy prosecuted them. She is sitting there and guess what? She got her conviction overturned on the jury instructions and on stand your ground. All right. So those people who are arguing against stand your ground are now portraying this as a win for an African-American female in Jacksonville who fired a warning shot. So if my guy fired a warning shot, the state attorneys would still prosecute him for that very warning shot. All right, Corey, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for I coming by. It. Thank I appreciate you, your time as well. Thank you.